people, I'm sorry if my sofa is incredibly not horizontal and having issues setting up my tripod, it's at a ridiculous angle right now. Um, also, I don't know what the weather's doing, it was boiling hot and now it's gone all miserable, so what is that about? However, today's video is on aerobic and anaerobic respiration, that tricky biology topic. I'm going to talk about the differences between them, but first of all I'm going to start by outlining the fact that respiration is not breathing. People always think that they're the same thing and they're totally not. Breathing, or as it's more correctly known, ventilation, is just the matter of moving air into our lungs and back out again. So that is breathing, and it's through breathing that we actually allow oxygen to enter our bodies. However, respiration is that process which occurs at cellular level inside the mitochondria of cells, and that's where aerobic respiration takes place. And it's a process whereby we release lots and lots of energy from the food we've eaten. So you need to get this straight. Breathing is just a matter of moving air into and out of your lungs. Respiration is that process that occurs in mitochondria in cells and produces lots and lots of energy. So let's start with aerobic respiration. Aerobic meaning using lots of oxygen as opposed to anaerobic respiration, which means respiration without oxygen. So let's first of all take the equation for aerobic respiration. So we're going to be taking oxygen into our bodies, so it's oxygen plus glucose, which we've eaten in our food, an arrow, and then you're going to produce carbon dioxide, which you'll breathe back out, lots of water, which you're breathing out as water vapour, and finally energy, which is the whole reason we're doing this. Some of you guys out there will need to know the balanced symbol equation, and that is oxygen, O2, plus glucose, which is C6H12O6, produces CO2, which is carbon dioxide, plus H2O plus energy and you need to put sixes in front of the CO2, the H2O and the O2 in order to balance this equation. So, I, like I said, it occurs in the mitochondria of cells and it's our way of releasing lots of energy. Now what do we need to use that energy for? Well we need to use it to build up smaller molecules into large ones, so for example building amino acids into proteins. We need it to maintain our body temperatures because as mammals we know that we are warm blooded. And lastly we need energy to help our muscles contract there's lots of other things we need energy for, but those are the three main ones. However, sometimes we can't get enough oxygen into our bodies to allow us to aerobically respire, and this time we'll choose to do anaerobic respiration. Some such example of this could be when you're sprinting, like the 100 meter race at school, you just can't breathe fast enough and your heart's not pumping hard enough to get that oxygen to the muscles where it's needed, so you'll use anaerobic respiration. The advantage of this is that you can use it when there's not enough oxygen around, but the problem is that it releases far less energy in comparison to aerobic respiration. And you may have seen also that glucose, rather than being broken down immediately into carbon dioxide and water, is instead broken down into lactic acid. Now, lactic acid is toxic and it leads to that horrible, stitchy, crampy feeling, so it leads to muscle fatigue and cramping, and that's kind of problematic. So what we need to do is take in even more oxygen into our body post-run, post-race, in order to break down that lactic acid into carbon dioxide and water. And that extra amount of oxygen that we need is something we call the oxygen debt. Um, and all it does is it means that it's allowing way more oxygen into our bodies to allow that lactic acid to be broken down so it stops causing fatigue. Right, I think that's everything I wanted to say actually on aerobic and anaerobic respiration. It's not too long a topic. I'm going to do a separate video on breathing, the main differences between breathing. I'm going to touch on respiration again, but I'm also going to talk about the mechanical process of the diaphragm flattening ribs moving out etc so look out for another video on that and I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you very soon. Don't forget to subscribe. Question 4. Diagram 1 shows a yeast cell. Name structures A and B. Great if you have learnt the structure of a yeast cell and a fungus cell but if you haven't don't panic here just put what you would normally do considering it was an animal or plant cell and you can see that A is the cytoplasm because it's the jelly of the cell and that B is the cell membrane because outside of that is the cell wall. Yeast cells can respire anaerobically. The equation for anaerobic respiration in yeast is glucose is broken down into alcohol plus carbon dioxide plus energy. Give one way in which anaerobic respiration in yeast cells is different from anaerobic respiration in human muscle cells. The main difference here is that in yeast you can see that alcohol is produced as a product, whereas in human muscle cells alcohol is not produced. The second difference you could provide is the fact that in human muscle cells anaerobic respiration leads to, what's it called? I'm being crazy, lactic acid being produced, whereas in yeast cells no lactic acid is produced. That was pretty poorly done. 4C, yeast can also use other types of sugar instead of glucose. Some scientists investigated the effect of three different types of sugar on the rate of anaerobic respiration in yeast. The scientists used the apparatus shown in diagram 2 with glucose sugar, kept the apparatus at 20 degrees and repeated the investigation with fructose sugar and then with mannose sugar, repeated the investigation with water instead of the sugar solution. 
give two control variables the scientists used in this investigation. So what do they need to keep the same in order to make sure it's a fair test? First of all, you could state that they need to use the same volume of yeast, the same volume of sugar, maybe the same concentration of sugar, and then the obvious one here is temperature. For C part 2, the graph shows the scientists' results. From this information, a company decided to use fructose to produce alcohol and not mannose or glucose, explain the reason for the company's choice. So let's just have a quick look at that graph. And you could say here that more carbon dioxide is given off with fructose compared with glucose and mannose, and that's due to the um, faster respiration of the yeast. So you could say that fermentation occurs much more quickly and therefore alcohol will be made much faster. And from a company's point of view, that is a very important thing. Diagram 1 shows the cell from the pancreas. Diagram 2 shows part of the cell seen under an electron microscope. Part A is where most of the reactions of aerobic respiration happen. Name parts A, and you should know that that is the mitochondrion or the mitochondria. Complete the equation for aerobic respiration, glucose plus energy. And remember I just told you that produces carbon dioxide, water plus energy. Part 3. Part A uses oxygen. Explain how oxygen passes from the blood to part A. Oh, there's no diagram. Okay, you're going to have to pick up here that it's about diffusion, and you need to say that oxygen moves from an area of high concentration, which is in the blood, to a low concentration in the mitochondria, and you need to say that that occurs across the cell membrane. Remember, it's not partially permeable here because um, we're not talking about osmosis. The pancreas cell makes enzymes. Enzymes are proteins. Describe how the ribosomes in part A help the cell to make enzymes. First of all, you'd say that ribosomes make proteins, that's actually their job, and they make them out of amino acids, so that's the second available mark. And thirdly, you need to say that part A, the mitochondria, provides the energy needed for this process. 14. Yeast can respire anaerobically and is used to produce beer. Write the word equation for anaerobic respiration in yeast. So remember that they use glucose, and what they do is they break that down into carbon dioxide plus ethanol. You could have written alcohol if you didn't want to specify ethanol there. Describe a test you could use to identify the gas produced when yeast respires anaerobically. Okay, more of a chemistry answer here, but it's to do with the carbon dioxide. And you want to say that lime water here turns cloudy in the presence of carbon dioxide. 11. The passage describes the role of the blood transport system. Complete the passage by writing a suitable word in each blank space. The blood cells are transported in a straw-coloured liquid called plasma. In this liquid... There are red blood cells that contain the protein haemoglobin that is used to carry oxygen around the body. The oxygen is used by the cells in aerobic respiration. Remember that is respiration requiring oxygen, unlike anaerobic respiration which doesn't require oxygen. So the gas, carbon dioxide, produced by the cells in respiration is transported to the lungs and is exhaled with water vapour when we breathe out. Other components transported in the plasma are platelets that help the blood to clot following a cut or injury and white blood cells that are involved in preventing infection. Some of these white blood cells release specific molecules called antibodies to destroy bacteria. Other white blood cells called phagocytes can surround and engulf invading bacteria. 11. The diagram shows a human sperm cell. How many chromosomes are there in the nucleus? Well remember Gametes such as sperm and eggs are haploid, which means that they have 23 chromosomes altogether as opposed to 46, so the answer here is 23. Respiration takes place in the middle piece of the sperm cell. Explain why respiration is important to a sperm cell, and that's because respiration generates energy which is needed to help the sperm to swim. A sample of semen contains 40 million sperm cells, that's a crazy number. Only 60% of these sperm cells are capable of swimming. Calculate how many sperm cells in the semen sample are capable of swimming. Show you're working. So you're working out 60%. So that's 60 divided by 100, as it's a percent, times it by 40 million, which I'm actually just going to write as words because I think it's easier like that. If you type that into your calculator, you'll get an answer, which is 24 million, or you could write it out in numbers. D. Some men are infertile because they do not produce enough sperm cells, or the sperm cells they produce are not good swimmers. There is a test that can be used to find out if a man is infertile. Semen is added to a solution in a test tube. The test tube is then sealed. The solution stays purple if oxygen is present and changes to pink if oxygen is absent. The diagram shows how the test works. So if it stays purple, then it is infertile because that means oxygen isn't being used in respiration. If it goes pink, then it tells us that the oxygen is absent and that that person is therefore fertile because that oxygen has been used in respiration. 
The man used his test and the solution remained purple. What does this suggest about the man's sperm? Explain your answer. I kind of just alluded to that. But because it remains purple, it means the oxygen is still present. So you need to say here that the man isn't using up the oxygen in respiration and therefore means that there are few sperm that can swim properly because they're just not generating enough energy. So the first mark you'd say that he's not using oxygen and for the second one you'd say he's not respiring. Suggest two reasons why the results of the test might not be correct. Okay, anything sensible here. Something like the fact that the seal may be broken or maybe the semen sample is too small. Potentially it was kept for less than one hour or maybe it was only done once and there was an anomalous result. Thank you.